of uh, assurance that the, the software is doing what it has to do. So that's, that's the things that I'm going to, to talk today and uh, try to provide you the means to do all these things. And well, I will start with a very quick overview, well, very quick uh, overview of the safety critical part of the of the evolution of the language of the aid and native languages that will be very fast. Then I will tell, I will uh, enter into into the matter of the talk, which is about the Spark uh, 2014. What is it? What what is that language, and why would you? like to use it. Uh, then I'll tell you a bit about what I've been talking, how to do modular verification by either formal proofs or testing, and how you combine them. And then I will tell you a few conclusions about, about that, about the status of the of language, about the status of the tools around it, about feedback from people using it. So first, um, rather quickly, something about language. So first, why, why is Spark derived from Ada? The main reason is that Ada, you know, from the beginning, has been designed to be clear, to be precise, and to have very well-defined semantics. And this is one example, for example, how when you compare something written in Ada and something written in, in C. If you look at them, well, I have to say I feel, I feel easier to read this Ada code, but then that's normal. I've been working with, with Ada for a long time. But then it's not only it's not only about, um, about how easy it is, because if, if you have some practice if you read C on the Ada quite easily. The thing is that <coughs> There are many things that make that make things much more evident. If you want to say that you have a variable and you expect that variable to be to get a value from the execution of a, of a sub program, it's quite easy to say, okay, this is an out variable and belong with it. You know that it's the value of that value when, when when you pass, when you call the procedure and you, call, you put something in test, the, the value before before the execution of the subprogram is if you don't care. If you, if you put a, a, a star in C, it doesn't mean that that's an out value. It means that it's something that you can modify, but you can also read it. So it's not that, as precise as you would like. Same thing, same thing for, for input variables. But as I said, there is there is some more, some more things in the language about semantics of the language. Uh, one of the things, for example, with this we distinguish a test when you want to test whether something is equal to something. We don't write it the same way as when you do an assignment because they are things which are completely different in nature. You, when you are comparing, you are not modifying anything. So when you are assigning, you are modifying something. You, you want to, to, to be clear about that. Uh, you, you don't want to mix like in the while loading C, you don't want to mix things of, of very different nature. You're mixing their assignment tests on the on the end of a loop, all in a, in a single line. Well, people people like in C, they may they may say, okay, yeah, because I mean, we don't need to write anymore. This is clear. This is concise. That's fine. But I find I find much easier to understand the behavior of a system when you have clear boundaries between what the different things that the program is doing. But again, it's, that's 
that I could say it's a matter of taste. There are other things which are, which I would, I would think are more important. It's about the behavior of your system. And this is, well, this is Jean-Pierre uh, told this thing at the beginning of the day today. I mean, buffer overflows, all these things, I mean, still, that's, we are in 2014, and that's still an issue with see. Why? It's so easy to get rid of that. I mean, you simply need to know what, with the things you are dealing with. When you know that you are dealing with an array of such 10, then you know what you can do with it. Um, don't try to write the memory which is just uh, after your array, because that's not what you want to do. And that's what C could allow you to do. And, well, one thing, one interesting thing is to be able to detect that at the execution time. Because at, at least there is no damage. You execute it, and you are not modifying what you are not supposed to, to be modifying. But what is much better from a, for a developer is to be able to be sure that that thing won't happen. And that's, uh, that these are the kind of uh, verification that we may get with, uh, with languages and tools like Spark. With Spark, you, have the, you run the tool and it will tell you either, no, you will never have any buffer of around here, or, or it, can tell, it, can, it can tell you, Okay, if you may have a buffer of around here if this condition is true and this condition is true. And that's what we want with this, <coughs> let us say, new kind of tools. To be able to know in advance, statically, before executing things, how your program will behave. So you asked very quickly, we can say, as, a, uh, as an outline of what we have said, uh, the thing is that if you, if you use languages like Ada or Spark, with respect to C or similar languages, you, have, you can easy, very easily get rid of buffer or integral overflows, any, any kind of overflow, by, because inherently in your language, you have all the information about the types, the objects you are dealing with. So that you can detect either at the uh, execution time with ADA, with normal ADA, or with languages and tools like this part, you can detect them statically and know, know this problem before you execute. Uh, well, just, just to give an idea about where, where to, how, to, how to put in context this Spark uh, 2014 language. Um, going very quickly, we saw this morning that, well, there a few interesting things that, that appeared in ADA 83, which are still in, in the most, more recent versions of ADA. It's basically, if we have to choose one of the things, the things that are more interesting are modularity. You can develop modules independently and you can link them together and make them work together. Support for generic things. You do, you do write an algorithm that can work on several different times, but you write it once. Of course, one of the bases is type safety. Typing system in ADA is one of the biggest things we have. <coughs> and support for tasking in the language. We have seen this morning a very nice demo about how to use tasks, how easy it is to, to write tasks. This morning there was a question about how, did, how would it be much more difficult to write the same thing in C? And I can tell you, it is. It is much more complex because well, 
I'm working on the on the runtime system for the compiler, and we know the things we have. Basically, the idea is we have this tasking in data, and we translate that into the equivalent calls to the threading system underneath. And we have to do many, many things to make things run. So it's very complex doing that, doing the things correctly in C. Much more easy to do in data. Then in that data, 95 came with object-oriented programming and some uh, addition to the tasking system, which is the use of protected, protected objects that we have seen this, this morning as well. Then after that data, uh, 2005 was uh, quite influenced by the nice things that we have in Java. And uh, one of the nice things that we have is interfaces, and then we introduce that into the language. And uh, something interesting as well that was introduced is the notion of containers. Containers are very, let's say, are big libraries of types or elements that you use very regular, very usually in your code. You, you may need, many times you have the need of defining a set of things, a list. So that is already predefined in data. You have the support to use them very easily. And then, in either 2012, the big thing that was introduced was contracts. And with contracts, the possibility of entering much in a much more easy way into the formal proofs uh, world. So, parallel to that, so this is the evolution of the era language, there is the evolution of the Spark language. And the Spark language originally and associated to it at 2005, 95, and 93 was um, a language where, as, as there were not contracts in the Ada language, you put contracts in comments and then the tools could know that they were contracts. And uh, well, it, you have to ver you have to restrict the Ada language that you use so that the, this um, this tool can be applied and you can get uh, the formal proof analysis of the of your application. Then, as I said, there were in the two thousand and twelve there were the contracts, and then it was the possibility of saying, okay, we have contracts in Ada now. We have a similar concept of contract in this part. Why don't we merge them together? And that's one of the things that uh, happened with this part 2014. First thing is try to get use of the new ADA 2012 language and use what you can already use in ADA for writing in this part uh, code. The second nice thing about doing that is this contract magically becomes executable because they are part of the other language. A contract is a, is a place where you say, I am expecting something from my caller. I am doing something for, for him. But these things are inherently, they are checks that are performed at runtime. So it means that if you want the contracts, you can use them both for analyzing statically your code or for verifying at execution time that the contract is more respected. And at the same time, we said, okay, coming from uh, user experience, we know that there are many there are a few restrictions in the Spark language that some customers would like to, to be removed. So let's try to, see, to see what we can do in that respect. So we came to <coughs> be able to write code like this one. And as I said, there is, I mean, in the contract, in the programming by contract paradigm, the thing is that you say, okay, I am a super program in this case, this one, and um, um, first, 
I am expecting that people calling me are doing something which is uh, which is represented by the pre keyword, which is the precondition. It means that people calling me, they need to respect these things. And these things can be checked either at execution time or by analyzing your code. And then you say, okay, if if you are respecting, and then we, I mean, we are going to see a bit more into details what these different elements mean. But now, for now, the only thing is that I want to I want you to know is that the precondition is something that the caller needs to guarantee. And then, if, you, if your caller guarantees that, you say, okay, if you if you give me that. In exchange, I'll guarantee all these things, which is the post condition, which means the post condition is a mathematical representation of the behavior you expect from your program. I mean, it's basically, it's design, design information. It is, for example, I mean, if we take a much simpler Function. Imagine a function which is, I will increase the value I, I receive as, as input. The post condition can be simply, okay, the value that I will return is one plus the value that I have in the, at the input. Plus, you may want to say, okay, if, if, yes, ah, if by if by adding one. <coughs> Then well, I'm going to to be outside of the boundaries of my type. The result uh, will be this one. So the post condition is the the design the information to say that says okay this is what my program is supposed to do. And then there, there are some other some other things. Which is where well, global global is outside in the 2012. It's about accessing global variables and depends. We'll see that later as well. It's a Spark 2014 thing, which is say uh, is there to let you represent uh, information flow of the of your program. Basically, in the depends is where you say, okay, my Output value will be computed using the input value plus a global variable that is somewhere. <coughs> so that's that's basically how a contract looks like. This is a this one is a, a Spark 2014 contract. It's not an EDA contract, but an EDA an EDA 2012 contract would be the same removing the global and the defense. Well, sir, uh, would a NATO compiler be allowed to be able to compile this just to know the yeah. Spark specific stuff? That's a, so that, that's the, <coughs> the advantage of using uh, aspects. So this is what? The width, the width something is introducing aspect, and aspect is some additional I mean, additional information that you pass that it's not that it, I mean the compiler doesn't need to interpret that information if it, if it doesn't know how to do it. So it's basically what you define. You may define an aspect if, if you are developing a tool for I don't know doing any kind of static analysis. The idea is that you define that separate aspect. And then that uh, aspect uh, should be ignored by the compiler or other tools. Uh, as we said, Ada, Ada has always been one of the important, one interesting part in Ada was the, its typing functionality. And uh, the there is something interesting is that with um, with the uh, 2012 now you can do with types you can do much 
uh, things you can uh, explore the notion of contract also for times and you can define things like what is at the top which is type predicates which is basically how to define properties of these objects in ADA before it before that you can define you could define a type like in my type is uh, for example a new date with range you could define I could uh, want to change the boundaries of the type but you couldn't define you couldn't take a time and say okay I want a new type which is basically this element and this element and this element at least there was not an easy way to do that and now you can do that you can for example select elements from types with type predicates you can define some more uh, evolved <coughs> characteristics of the time which are for example you can like in this case it represents it represents a message and a message comes with a date when it was uh, sent and the date when it was received you can represent things like I want to make sure that the date when the message was sent is always uh, before the date when the message was uh, received this is the kind of expressiveness that we can get or you can, well, this is, I think we are not going to go into the details, but you can also define this kind of, uh, of characteristics for private times that you are using through a specified interface. But that's mostly a detail. So let, let's go into, into talking about what is as part of 2012 and what gives you. So there is first the, the, the history of the Spark. Spark was, uh, I don't know when it, there was the first version of the Spark, but uh, it has at least 20 years. So the, the first the Spark, the Spark language was defined first as a subset of ADA they took ADA and they said okay this is the subset of ADA that we consider safe so this is the part of ADA that we can use and on, on top of that we are going to add all the contract information that we need to perform formal proofs on ADA, on ADA program and they they did it and they had to do that using comments a special kind of comment because the compilers I mean, the ADA language didn't have that so the compiler needed to be able to skip that part and with that you could do mainly three things first is and this is probably the thing, the thing that is more widely used by users is that I want to make sure that there will not be runtime errors. That when I am accessing elements in an array, there is no possible way of trying to go outside the, the boundaries of the array. I don't, I don't even want a runtime exception being raised. I just want the tool, what the tool? The tool plus the design of my application telling me don't worry about that. There will no, there will no be a buffer overrun. Then the way, with that language, could also verify that the flow information that you added was correct when you were saying, "Okay, my procedure is only reading this and this and this variable." The analysis tells you, "Yeah, you are right. That's correct. We are only using these variables, no other variables." And the third thing, a quite important thing, is functionality correctness. When you say my procedure is doing this, and I, do, I describe this, this by a contract by saying, okay, 
I am going to increase the, the output value by one. The analysis tells you, yes, you are right, you are respecting your contract. And then, as I said, ADA 2012 came in with a contract language within it. And then the idea was to try to get use of that by using the contracts are something that is for, that can be formally proved, but also you can run them and verify at execution time that the, this, uh, this contract has respected. Let's try to make the language bigger so that the users are not that much restricted. And uh, well, that is about um, trying to be able to have a mix of testing and formal proofs for verifying your system. And well, that is a typical line that we have all seen about how to live, how expensive it is to fix a problem within your development process. The problems that you get to detect late are very expensive to fix. So the, the goal, as any other tool in the, in the world, is try to detect things as early as possible. And how? One of the, one of the things that, uh, that we try is to be able to mix <coughs> formal proofs and traditional unit testing. So if you, if you have a look at the typical development cycle, the thing that, that the SPART tries to address is everything that is within these boundaries. You can define, you can define and verify architectural information, uh, low-level requirements information. You can make, you can do things with, with the code. You can make sure of the robustness of the code. You can use that for verifying different units that we develop. And you can, well, of course, verify the architecture that you define. And uh, the thing is that we, we try to achieve follow the, the information we get from, from customers saying, okay, the most expensive part of our development is testing. And in addition to that, it's not perfect. So you tell me, okay, I can try to prove things, but I can, I can remove, uh, I can remove uh, tests. But the difficulty is that sometimes it's if, if I want to do that for all the system, it's very difficult. And there is a part. I mean, there is typically a part that you can formally prove in a <coughs> reasonable way, but there is a part which is very complex. So the thing and the goal is to be able to do formal proofs on things that are practical to do that and do typical unit tests for the rest. Uh, uh, so here is the, the kind of things that we want to that we reuse within the, within the new Spark 2014 language that come that come from the ADA language, the ADA 2012 language, which is the contracts of both subprograms and types, and the. Uh, there is a new kind of, of, of expression that is very handy for writing these contracts, which is this kind of quantifiers, because you can do, for example, you can ensure properties in all elements of, uh, of an array or a set or in some, so it, it's very flexible. Uh, so one, as I mentioned, and well, we are not going to see everything because it's not, it's not very interesting, but the, one of the things that you can express in the new language is the, the way you access 
through global variables. When you, when, you, you, when you implement your program, you need to say, okay, I want to use this variable as an input, this global variable as an input, or as an output, or both, input and output, and that you can define with, with, with this syntax, where you basically put on the right side the inputs, and on the, on the left side, um, the no, this is not. This is the effects. This is only where you say things that are used as input, output, or in input and output, or eventually you may want things that are only used not by the implementation, but by the way you define your content. So that's simply uh, that. Uh, you can also define the, in, how the information flows within your subprogram. And uh, you can use this kind of, uh, of aspect, which is, which is the defense aspect, where you basically say, for example, if you take the first line where you say A, B, R row class A, A, X, and Y. Well, the class is simply to say that I am depending on myself. I am computing my next value based on my current value. This is the class. But if you skip the, the class, it means that A and B, they use for the next value, they are using A, X, and Y. So that's the kind of, um, the kind of information that you can express with that. And well, this is a small example where you basically are saying that when I'm computing, when I'm computing my new G value, which is, by the way, a global variable, variable I am taking into account <coughs> the two input variables that I'm having here. So this is how, how you, you express the flow information. Uh, in terms of the subset of ADA that, that is supported, well, there are still there are a few things that are not yet uh, supported, some because it makes this global analysis very complex, and that's, for example, that's the reason why pointers access type are not supported. And there are some other things that are expected to be in the language, but are not there yet, such as tasking. Tasking will be there, but not yet. And uh, dark times will be there. And this is, well, this is uh, an outline of things that have been added. For example, gener support for generics have been added, and <coughs> a few more details. Nothing really very important. Another, another thing that, uh, that is being added is support for formal, formal containers. As we said, containers is a library where you have access to common data types such as lists, sets, etc. Typically, the, the way you implement them is by using point, pointers all around. That's the way you, you keep a list ordered by changing pointers. So they are inherently, they are not used you can't use them with this with this Spark 2012 uh, 14 language, but we are working on defining new containers that can be used uh, in this context with all the properties that are required that will be formally defined for you to just use them. Uh, some additions, for example, an evolution of uh, of the way contracts can be written in ADA 2012, but that we found quite convenient, and that's why we put that into the in this part, is what we call the contract cases. We noticed that many times when you write a contract, when you write the behavior of a subprogram, 
you, it's it's very common that you that you write. Okay, if my my input value is positive, then the result is this one. If my input value is zero, my result is that. If my input value is negative, my result is that. You can write that with an if statement like the one on top. But we find that it's much it's easier to read if you define what we call contract cases, where you put the condition before it's similar to a case statement. So you put the condition and you put the result afterwards. So it's it's a matter of convenience. I mean, you don't gain anything. There is nothing. I don't think there is anything that you can write this way that cannot be written that way. But it's much easier to understand. Uh, with respect to the behavior, there are some things when you prove, when you try to formally prove things, <coughs> it's quite common that you need to to say determine. I mean, loops are not easy, and sometimes you need help to demonstrate the things that change and doesn't change with the loop. And this is what we express with the loops invariant, which says, okay, it is. Is not going to is not going to change any with the, any iteration of the loop, and the loop variant is going to say, okay, this is the thing, this is the thing that is going to increase, so you know or decrease, so you know that if you have a condition which is while i is uh, is smaller than ten, if you know that uh, i is increasing and that you start with a um, with a value which is inferior to the to the boundary, you know that eventually you will get there and you leave the loop. Uh, I think we are going to pass quickly this part. So basically, the idea is what this is. This is a certification um, uh, DO 178 uh, avionic certification, which basically defines the different uh, parts of uh, the development. And the thing is that what we try with the Spark is to be able to help you into making sure that the code that you write is the code that is expected from the definition of the architecture that you did. We want to make sure that the code is uh, robust. It means we want to make sure that there will not be an exception being raised anywhere, say, by because you wanted to access something that is outside the boundary. And we want to make sure as well that the, the code that is written is compliant to the contracts, to the definition that you did before about what the code is supposed to do. So basically, what we try is to do that make mixing these two different approaches. So what can what can you do in terms of dynamic tests or verifications that you can do at execution time? So basically, preconditions for post conditions are simply assertion. So it's something that you could even write before having contracts, but it's much more convenient to write them as contracts because with contracts, you put them into the specification, into the visible part of, the, of your program. And if you put assertions within your implementation, your implementation will be quite polluted by the presence of uh, assertions everywhere. Imagine that you have a code where you have uh, three different return statements, and before all that, you need to check the the return that you are going to the value that you are going to return. It's much easier to write it once and let tools take care of that. And you can control those contracts that you want to be active or not at any time. Uh, as I said, 
contract <coughs> cases is the same thing, it's contract, but you can describe <coughs> them in a more convenient way. And the advantages of, uh, of being able to execute the contracts <coughs> is that it gives you very quick feedback during, during your development about whether you are really implementing what you are expected to implement. Obviously, during testing is very valuable because you are, I mean, you, even, you could even define your tests without specifying the, the expected results. If you are able to define completely your behavior with a post condition. Imagine if it, the same example is if you define a function increasing the input value and you define test cases for that and you know that the post condition is okay my output will be one plus my input that's enough you don't need to say okay if I put a three as input I expect a four as an output no that's implicit within the contract so that simplifies testing and you can use them as uh, defensive programming at execution time when the system is deployed. And in terms of formal validations, basically that these are the four different things that you can do. Data and information flow, which is about I am really using the, va the variables that I am expecting to use and I'm really computing my output, taking into account the input that I wanted to use. The robustness analysis is whether I'm going to have any exception raised at execution time. I might try, is it possible that I can try to access an array outside of its boundaries or not? And of course, checking that you are implemented what you said in the contract that you were going to implement. Uh, well, that's uh, basically once you have put all the all the full information, you can make sure that you are using input variables as input variable, output as output. You are not trying to use something that is not initialized yet. And you can do this kind of analysis very quickly. Uh, same thing with respect to global variables. You can make sure that you are using them as you define you were using them. Uh, for example, here, if you, if you are modifying, uh, yeah, if, you are, if your code is modified by global variable G, and you didn't say that in advance, the tool will tell you, will tell that you are doing something that you are not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, the same thing for an uninitialized variable. You will you get messages saying, okay, here, here you may be trying to access something before being initialized, so you would be using a, a, an unknown variable. Uh, what, as I said, one of the most interesting things is to be able to make sure that you, there is no exception being raised within your execution. Yeah, you can, you can, make a static analysis and make sure that all these different checks will be respected at execution time and you can make sure for example that there will not be any division by, by zero any place in your code and of course you can make sure that you uh, that your code respects the contract that you are that you are making visible to the user, and then in the contracts, it's uh, the contracts are checked. Uh, well, preconditions are checked 
when the saffron is cold, those conditions are all are checked just before returning. Uh, well, yes, that's that's how information is presented to you. If you use the static analysis, you will see in red the lines that uh, that may not be respected. In this case. You are, we are saying that uh, the loop invariant that is present here uh, may fail after the first iteration. So it means the first iteration, that will always be respected, but the second may not be true. So that's what the, the feedback you get. There, has, there have been a few case studies that I will show you quite quickly the kind of feedback that we got from there. Basically what this is, I mean the different lines refer to different pieces of their code. The important information is here in this column, we have the number of subprograms, and here in this column is the number of runtime checks. If you access uh, an array, there will be a, an index check. So this is, this is to give you an idea about the size of the of the different uh, modules and this is the percentage of things that they were they could prove formally and you can see that they can reach quite big values and they could even get to 100 percent in some cases and um, quite close in some others so yes to conclude quite quickly the thing is that if you, if you really want, if you really need to go to the highest levels of safety, this kind of technology has already been, this is, it comes from feedback from customers working with, in this kind of domain. And uh, it is a technology which is already in more than 20 years being used, at least the core part of it. And the good thing is that the, with the new with the new Spark 2012 and its very close relationship with the 2012, you can start using that language slowly and progressively. You can start developing I mean, one module using that, but the rest you keep doing them as you were doing before. Because we, it helps you build up all these uh, formal proofs if you need them, or if you want them. Well, basically here, well, it's uh, about areas that work where this technology works well, and there were, we detected some places where we needed to, to improve the technology. And that will, uh, this is something that we is going to to be available very, very soon. We have, I mean, this is being beta tested now, and the uh, first release is expected uh, in 2014, April 2014, so just three months. And, uh, well, you can have access to all this, this web page where the, the design information, more, much more detailed information about the language, about what is ported, how, what is, what are the technologies we will use, etc. So that's the place where you can get some information if you are interested. And that should be, yeah, that should be it. That's it. Thank you. If you have any questions.